And thank you for coming back to the keynote lunchtime session. And uh, thank you again to all of our virtual guests and viewers who are watching on YouTube and on LinkedIn. Thanks again so much for joining us today um, and to hear the audience uh, with us. So we're going to kick off now for the lunchtime session with um, our keynote discussions. Um, so first off, we're going to kick off with Steve Norris. <laughs> Steve, you're back on. Um, so, yeah, so we're just going to kick off with Steve. Steve, thank you very much for joining today. Steve is the chair of Future Built, and he is coming to give a keynote speech to all of you. Welcome. Um, are we, um, well, let me, well, let me just um, first of all say thank you to Bosch for organizing this event. It's great to see that actually it's attracted an awful lot of interest, which is terrific and um, I think entirely appropriate. Um, obviously, the main theme is hydrogen, and, um, and so it should be, because uh, I think you know what, what in the transportation space everybody recognizes is that uh, you can't run a 38-ton truck on battery. The battery would weigh seven tons. You couldn't run construction equipment on battery. Uh, JCB3C, which most people in this audience um, uh, uh, and most of whom I know the name, date of birth, and uh, drinking habits of, um, uh, will uh, also know that, you know, 3C, the battery would weigh seven tons. Hydrogen's a massive, massive, serious issue for the world, and in terms not just of transportation, but in so many other areas, including, of course, construction. But you know what struck me, and just as an introduction to future builds, and in a sense, a link to why we're here. What's absolutely extraordinary about human evolution is that science has managed to take water and extract from it the two molecules of hydrogen and oxygen, uh, store the oxygen if you need for medical purposes or for other purposes, and use the energy implicit in hydrogen to power some of the most powerful devices in the world. It's astonishing, and it's a reflection of human progress. What's extraordinary about construction is that, in comparison, it simply hasn't moved. I mean, we are building now essentially the way the Chinese built the Great Wall of China. Uh, we uh, put some large stone around. We try and glue the stone to other stone, and you know, we've refined the process slightly, but by comparison, uh, we are literally living in the Stone Age. Um, construction has hardly moved. Now, governments around the world have reflected that. They've recognized the fact that we ought to try to move construction into the 21st century in the same way that we are looking at energy, no longer just burning coal. Coal is precisely the problem, and all of those. Uh, all of those carbon fuels which are associated with coal are the problem. It's a problem for the planet, and it could be a fatal problem for the planet. Looking at construction, again, we need to try to move into the 21st century. Uh, and that's why, you know, the government here uh, is uh, actually putting substantial amounts of money behind what they call MMC, Modern Methods of Construction. Now, you know, a lot of that modern methodology um, is these days in the form of basically modular built, um, large slab uh, prefabs. Uh, it's quite interesting because I was born and brought up in Liverpool and um, uh, I remember seeing in about 1948 um, some of the early prefabs. Um, there's nothing really new about prefabrication. Believe it or not, I did um, the sort of idiotic research which people do when they're looking at a speech like this um, and looked up where was the earliest evidence of prefabs, prefabrication. And the answer is it goes back into centuries before Christ. It literally, uh, there's in early Mesopotamia, 
the signs of buildings being brought to an area and assembled on the site. So even you know, modular construction isn't particularly new. And what we're doing in Future Built is trying to get over that and think about the 21st century. So Future Build essentially, um, and uh, I'll show you a little bit of what we mean, um, uses CAD CAM, it uses BIM 4, BIM 5, B Building Information Management Systems, to be able to specify to millimeter precision how we will assemble a structure around which we will build. Um, that process uses 21st century technology and it's still being adapted. Uh, and what's more, uh, one of the advantages we have um, is that it allows us to, at the same time as we address uh, the simple process of erecting the building, to build quieter, cleaner, greener and quicker. Oh, and incidentally, at a very, very good price indeed, which is... Uh, for many people in the audience, probably even more important. Um, we're proud, incidentally, quite seriously, of our relationship with Bosch, uh, because, of course, uh, Bosch is not only a company that's recognized the significance of hydrogen, it's also a company that recognizes the importance of not just building the home, but of understanding what's going on in the home. At one level, it's simply about integrating white goods into information systems that allows us to detect faults or to indicate when repairs or replacements are necessary. But it can go so much further than that. In senior living accommodation, which is an increasingly part, uh, an increasing part of the housing market, uh, it actually allows us to ensure that elderly people can be monitored in a way that doesn't involve any visual interference, but actually does monitor their personal temperature, temperatures in the room, rate of running water, and so on. It can detect floods. It's a massive step forward. It's been around for some years, and I'm really proud of the fact that Bosch are right at the forefront of developing it, and that we in Future Build are very, very keen to incorporate it as we do into our developments. But essentially with LGS, uh, the process, as you'll see on the screen, uh, involves light gauge steel. Um, most people will know what I'm talking about, but light gauge steel is effectively itself 85% recycled and is 100% recyclable. In the form in which we use it, it lasts as long as you want it to. Not 50 years, 60 years, or 100 years. Literally, as long as you like. Unlike wood, it doesn't swell, it doesn't move, it doesn't shrink. And uh, whilst, of course, you know, if sufficient heat is applied, e even steel will melt, uh, it will do so on a much safer base than any wood construction. Um, that um, a picture will show you three elements of the, of the process. The first you can see in a very, very small booth which uh, a couple of my colleagues erected um, uh, literally in a few minutes, which incidentally is precisely why it's a very much quicker process, uh, just to show you essentially what it looks like. And you can see in the bottom right-hand picture there um, essentially what an outline shell will look like. That larger building um, is there for a purpose because uh, in the very limited time that I've got, I can't show you the full list of the processes and, and the buildings that we can build. Essentially, we build what you want. One of the real limitations of normal modular building, the slab building, is they've got four or five variations of, on a theme, and that's what you have to buy because that's what the factory is set up to be able to produce. Even Passive House, um, uh, this sort of process that you get uh, in Germany, for example, when Hofhaus uh, will sell you a, a lovely building, beautiful glass, most people know what Hofhauses look like, still you can only buy seven actual models. You simply pick their model. What you can't say is, well, I really like that, but I'd like a bit more here or a bit more there. We build whatever you want. And that building there, um, which is itself now um, uh, more than half uh, complete, um, is a, uh, up to, I think, nine story in total, series of blocks in uh, the city of Norwich, uh, in a place called St. Anne's, uh, built by Future Built, 
But at the same time, we built an apart hotel in Furnival Street, which is just off Chancery Lane, for those of you who wouldn't in a million years think of actually going to see it, but I promise you it's there. Um, and uh, we who built, you know, Premier Inn, uh, who built houses, obviously, but on the same estate, which we can show you, built a five-bedroom Mock Georgian and uh, a simple structure which accommodates two affordable homes. It's incredibly flexible, it's incredibly innovative, and as I say, the key in terms of moving forward in the environmental agenda is it's cleaner, it's quieter, it's less invasive, it actually consumes substantially less fossil fuel because, for example, we deliver on much lighter trucks, we avoid wet trades on site, uh, it's a much cleaner, modern process. And as such, of course, it's exactly what Bosch would be looking for in their UK partner, and we're very, very proud of it. Um, we think that, actually, in many ways, this is how, in the future, all homes will be built. Gradually, um, whether, for example, Grenfell might have contributed to this, people will recognise that wood, as a form and structure, has very serious limitations. Gradually, people will realise that using the techniques that the Chinese built to, uh, used to build the Great Wall and the Egyptians used to build the pyramids is perhaps something that we ought to try and move away from. Uh, it won't be long before this is not new, not something that I or any of my colleagues have to explain, but something that the industry will see is actually the way forward. I think that's my time. Uh, and thank you very much for listening, particularly to all my colleagues, all of whom have been here, because we're always going to have a party afterwards. So thank you very much indeed. Very good. Thank you so much, Steve, for that. That was hugely interesting. And if you do want any more information on that topic, I'm sure if you go over to the Future Build website, there'll be lots of information there about, about that topic too. Okay, so on to our next speaker. I am delighted to bring to the stage Helen McComb from the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills. Welcome, Helen. Hello. Um, as mentioned, I am not Mark Taylor. He sends his apologies. He's got a terrible cold today. Um, and it's not politic in these COVID times to cough on people, so um, I'm afraid you have me instead. I'm, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some innovation um, funding that we've been delivering from the UK government um, relating to hydrogen. In particular, I'm going to focus on the, hydro the High for Heat programme, um, but I'll touch on the, the range of things we do. So you're all doubtless aware that the UK government is legally committed to net zero, um, a whole suite of serious policy documents are um, flowing from that at the moment. Um, it's an undeniable challenge and the, the last mile is going to be especially difficult. What I think is interesting in terms of hydrogen is at the point at which the target went up to net zero, we had the Committee for Climate Change stating that hydrogen had moved from being um, an enabler um, of targets to being absolutely key. So it's, it's seen as something we can't do without um, to, to reach our targets and, and meet our aims. So the part of Bayes that I work for has been supporting hydrogen innovation um, for a while. Um, in the last spending period, which is the 2017 to 21 period, um, we had the projects that are shown on the slides here. We had support for hydrogen supply. Um, we had support at the end use stage that's called High for Heat that I'm going to particularly talk about. Um, but also we, we have projects that are about industrial fuel switching um, and actually quite a significant number of the projects that have gone forward there have used hydrogen. So we've had a, a range of projects going on, on over the last wee while. The High for Heat programme that I want to focus on, um, it started in around about 2017. And at that point, um, there was a lot of hype about hydrogen. You might think there's hype now, but the, the hype was there in 2017. It first started to come through with what was called the Leeds City Gate Report. And at that point, it was kind of posited that we could switch the gas grid to hydrogen quite easily. Um, but there wasn't really any detail or any kind of technical understanding about whether that would be possible. Um, so off the back of that, um, my part of Bayes set up the High for Heat programme 
um, to establish if it's technically possible, safe and convenient to replace natural gas um, with hydrogen in residential and commercial premises. Um, the programme itself, we've got a diagram of the different components of it. And actually, I'll go through the achievements, which will make it clearer. But we're attempting to look at hydrogen as, a, as an option in, in a variety of ways, particularly looking into the kind of technical aspects, see if we found any showstoppers. So we've been doing that now for a while. The programme's due to come to an end um, by next March. Um, the conclusion is that it is technically feasible to use hydrogen, and it's probably safe enough. It's safe enough, certainly, to test, um, and it should, should be able to be made safe. So in terms of technical skills and standards, um, what we found is kind of illustrated on the graph here, that basically it's possible to get hydrogen pure, pure enough to be um, a heating fuel, that it would be sensible to put um, odorant into it, the same way you do with natural gas at the moment, as a safety feature, um, that colorant probably doesn't need to be added centrally. Um, in fact, we found that the fire in the picture is one of the, the prototype fires that we funded. Um, it is possible to get an attractive flame picture, flame color um, with hydrogen without having kind of additives in the hydrogen itself. What else have we done? We've supported the development of a PAS 4444, which is a publicly available standard. It essentially sets out a consistent um, sort of testing and, and certification regime for showing that hydrogen appliances are, are sufficiently safe, reliable, and so on. And we've been doing some work with standards bodies on installation standards um, and training. Um, one of the big things in High for Heat has been prototype appliance development. So about half of the budget has gone towards appliance um, work. You have got the boiler upstairs, I believe, in the, in the display space. I'm sure everyone's had a chance to see that. Um, but the High for Heat project supported you know, multiple appliances to kind of see if it's, it's feasible to have them with hydrogen. And you've got the, the list of them on the slide. I think there's 27 could be wrong, but um, we've got quite a number of prototype appliances are in the process of being made at the moment. Um, they're making good progress. They should be um, all certified by, the ones that we want to be certified should all be ready and certified by the end of the year, possibly early next. Um, we're running slightly late due to COVID on some of them. But you can see the pictures there. Um, we call it in the hydrogen home, the sunflower flame on the, um, the hob that you can see down there. Um, that's just hydrogen, it's not coloured. Um, it is possible the, the kind of atmospheric pollution means that you get quite an orange flame, but you, you do get quite a, a visible flame. Um, we've got meters, meters has been challenging. Um, but yeah, we, we've, we've shown that it's possible to have a range of hydrogen appliances. One of the things Mark wanted to mention at this point was something that came out through the course of the programme was the idea of the hydrogen ready concept. Um, so that is the idea that, in terms of thinking ahead to a possible transition, that it would be very sensible to have appliances that are defined, certified, whatever, described as hydrogen ready, um, such that with, within an hour, possibly two, maybe 100 or 200 pounds kind of expenditure, it would be possible to have an appliance going into your home now that works on natural gas, but um, it's hydrogen ready, and so it can be quite easily and simply um, converted to run on hydrogen in the event of a grid transition. So that's something that's kind of developed as an idea in the UK, um, partly through the programme, and I think it's a very attractive um, concept for government, obviously, and, and you know, across the industry. It minimises, to a, it could potentially minimise to a huge extent the impacts of transition and rollouts. Sorry, I'm waiting for a new slide. There. Um, so the safety assessment is another thing that we've um, funded, um, completed through the High for Heat program. The publication happened, I think, in May. Um, we did see some confused media coverage at that point. Um, the key conclusion is that using 100% hydrogen can be made as safe as natural gas. Um, that's a conclusion that's been carefully scrutinised and checked by the HSC, um, who have said that the evidence from the, the safety assessment work um, is sufficient to have the networks be able to go ahead with a first community trial. 
Um, we've got some pictures on the slide there. I don't know if you're interested, but that's what Leavenmouth looks like, um, where the first houses are going to be converted onto hydrogen. Um, the safety assessment, it's not, it's not, you know, absolutely everything's done. You know, there's still important work that needs to happen and that is going ahead. Um, the main thing would be that we decided to start by thinking about the kind of most simple or manageable use case. So the safety assessment applies to detached, semi-detached and terraced homes of standard construction. Um, and, and that allows us to go ahead to trial. There. Um, and one of the other things the High for Heat program has supported is the hydrogen homes that I think I heard a couple of people mention earlier. Um, I went up with the minister for the launch um, in sort of July time. There's a picture, um, two, two semis. Um, we've got, we've got two, two boilers in the, in the program and we've got one, on, one in each home so that they, they can be seen. Um, we've got our cookers in place, the meters, the hobs, the fires. Um, so you can go and visit and see hydrogen action. Um, the main conclusion is it's not very different. It's pretty similar, to be honest with you. I mean, you can go and see it. It's quite interesting to see the, to see the, the, the hob. Um, if anyone wants to come and network with me at 2 o'clock in the upstairs bit, I've got my colleague at the Hydrogen Home on standby. On, so you can have a Teams video call if you would like, and you can be shown the hob um, if anyone has any interest. Um, you're absolutely very welcome to contact them for a visit if, if that's something that interests. They're in Low Thornley, um, just outside Gateshead. It's a really easy taxi from Gateshead Station. Um, Wynn Leighton Village, where they're doing a blending trial, um, uses the same hydrogen store as the, these hydrogen homes do. They're on a, a former British gas research site just slightly outside of town. But the team there would, would love to welcome you if you would like to go. So that's kind of high for heat program and what we've done through that. Um, I just wanted to just briefly mention some of the innovation work that we've, we've been supporting on the hydrogen supply competition. Um, I think the UK has got some really exciting projects that are and have been going on in terms of hydrogen, hydrogen supply. Um, these are the, the big five demos that we funded under the supply competition over the last spending period. So just to talk about two of them, because I'm doubtless running out of time. Yeah. Um, so the Progressive Energy um, Initiative there, they've got a plant that's now seeking planning permission. Um, we funded their feed study. Um, that's potentially going to become um, a real high kind of capacity hydrogen generation. And the other one that I get really excited about um, is the ERM Dolphin project um, that we've supported. They are making hydrogen on floating offshore wind platforms. So rather than bringing electricity back to then run electrolysis to, to create hydrogen, they're creating the hydrogen directly offshore and bringing that back, which is some quite interesting potential. They were the en engineer magazine's um, project of the year, I think, last year. So, and they've got some really exciting investment um, approaches, as I believe. And, sorry, I will just stop by pointing out that if you want to know more about Bayes' support for hydrogen and innovation, um, you can, I'm sure, find access to my slides and some links there. The big competition we've got open at the moment is industrial fuel switching to, um, so if anyone is aware of industrial sites that would like to um, demonstrate a hydrogen switch. We would love to hear from you um, up till about the 27th of November, I think. I mean, also Bayes has a lot more funding coming through at the deployment stage now as well. That's in the green box. Um, through the hydrogen strategy in the summer, they're consulting on the design of the net zero hydrogen fund that will support um, basically capex for new supply. And they're also consulting on the business model. Um, so we'll be going forward to a hydrogen future and be very interesting to see what comes next. Um, in the heating terms, this is the slide that explains um, where we think things might be going next. Essentially, that government is working to generate evidence to explore the potential for using hydrogen for heating. Um, that should inform a strategic decision in 2026 about the role of hydrogen. So, thank you very much for listening. 
Thank you so much, Helen. And, and as you heard, if you want to go and speak to Helen after this um, session, she will be upstairs as well. So thank you. So next, we're going on to our final speaker for the keynotes over lunch. And we have um, Adam Durant from Satavia. And Adam, you're joining us virtually. So welcome. Great to have you here. And uh, we will hand over to you. Thanks so much, Adam. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm Adam Durant. Chief Executive and Founder of Satavia. So we are a um, software and data analytics company based in Cambridge. Um, so that picture is King's College just down the road from us. Um, so we've built a team that combines experts in data science and AI, software engineering and aerospace engineering, and we combine that with atmosphere and climate scientists. Uh, and this is all encapsulated in the software that we build. So you'll see a photograph there of the um, volcanic eruption from Iceland in 2010. So that was really the beginning of my journey working with aviation. I, I did quite a bit of flight test at the time with Airbus and EasyJet. Um, and then that led me to found Satavia a few years later. Um, so today we're going to talk about the non-CO2 climate impacts of aviation, specifically the clouds that the aircraft make. So these are called contrails, and they're clouds of very small ice crystals. So the ice crystals might be of the order of 10 or 20 microns diameter. That's smaller than the thickness of a human hair. Um, so the engines burn kerosene. Kerosene emits CO2, we all know that, but also releases water. And in certain parts of the atmosphere, which are humid and ready to make clouds, the aircraft passing through can create these contrails. And the contrails can sit there for sometimes up to hours, and the ice crystals absorb heat from the Earth's surface that would have escaped to space and direct some of it back down, causing a surface warming effect. Uh, they also interact with sunlight, so reflect some of that light back. Um, but overall, it's a surface warming effect. And recent research has shown that the climate forcing from these contrail clouds is actually twice as much as from the carbon dioxide that's released by burning kerosene, even when it lasts or sits in the atmosphere for 100 years. Um, there is, however, a solution. So smarter flight planning, so such as changing flight levels, uh, changing routing, maybe even timing of flights, can actually help to eliminate contrails. So we can work with aircraft operators at the flight planning stage or when the aircraft is in flight to make both strategic planning decisions to avoid flying through these ice supersaturated regions and making contrails. And also we can do the same during flight. So I guess this is important, not only because of the, the magnitude of, of the effect, but also because regulation is coming. So the industry will have to take action on this issue in the not too distant future. So we're actually developing a solution to, to work with operators to enable them to do the smarter flight planning. But we're also in parallel working on a method that we're getting accredited to incentivize the operators with carbon credits. So we can come in and calculate the climbing forcing that we've prevented by not making those clouds and convert it into a carbon dioxide equivalent amount ultimately enabling the airline to trade this as a carbon credit. So we're building a uh, attractive, viable business model behind a technical solution that could take out up to 60% of aviation's impact, uh, climate impact, but that's actually nearly 2% of all human climate change. So all of that solved with a simple data analytics solution that's almost ready today. So that leads us to our product. So today we can offer these data layers into bits of software that air aircraft operators use um, to enable them to do this smarter flight planning. And we would offer that in a, in a way that they're very familiar with, a monthly subscription type model. And ultimately we're aiming towards uh, doing carbon credits for them. Um, so this is what the product looks like. Uh, this is a slice through a single flight level uh, so we do a 24-hour forecast. The day before, we actually analyze all flights that an airline will take um, and select routes that we believe will have uh, large amounts of contrail formation. So not every flight produces a contrail. Some flights actually uh, produce contrails that have um, very large impact. So about 5% of all flights create more than 90% of the contrails problem. So what we end up doing is feeding these weather data layers 
into flight planning software. Uh, the red areas indicate airspace that if an aircraft flew through it, it would form uh, a contrail that would persist long enough to affect climate. So we're trying to avoid flying through those regions. And then we would adapt um, software algorithms that calculate the most efficient routing so that we minimize as much as possible any additional fuel burn. So as I said, we would initially aim to integrate into flight planning software. We can also integrate into the electronic flight bag on the flight deck, so that gives the pilot information. And we're also working with stakeholders in air traffic management to integrate this into air navigation service provider software. So uh, it's all feeding off of our core technology. We call it Decision X 5DX. So it's a software platform we've built in the commercial cloud. Uh, the core of this is a numerical weather prediction model. We're running at scales that may be hundreds of times more granular than what you'd typically find for the world's leading uh, weather organizations. We do incredibly accurate weather forecasting at altitudes where aircraft typically fly at, so 30, 40,000 feet, and it's all been validated. Uh, a lot of this development actually was supported through an Aerospace Technology Institute project called DISA that we're a partner on with Rolls-Royce and GK and Aerospace. Um, so I'm going to end by talking about uh, a groundbreaking flight that we've just completed uh, two weeks ago in partnership with Etihad and Boeing, uh, and it's part of the Greenliner uh, project. So on the 23rd of October, uh, Etihad ran a commercial revenue generating passenger carrying flight um, on which there were a whole range of interventions done. So GE uh, washed the engines. Boeing has software that makes the uh, flight trajectory highly efficient. Uh, they took all the plastic off of the disposable plastic off the flight as they could. And we supported the flight planning with contrail avoidance. And the aim was to make this flight have a climate impact that was over 70% less relative to 2019 flying done by the airline. Um, so you can see here is a photograph of me both in the flight ops room. So I was actually there in Abu Dhabi working closely with flight dispatch. And on the right, there's a photograph of me with um, Etihad's uh, Boeing 787 type pilot, Captain Mimo Catiano. So uh, we got this, this strong support and we were able to actually do this exercise. So what I'm going to show you now is a cross section, a flight profile through the original flight plan. So an airline will plan uh, a flight from A to B uh, following a number of parameters such as minimizing fuel burn, keeping the cost down as much as possible. So the black dotted line there you'll see is a cross section of altitude versus time. And then the colors are from our forecast of contrail formation. So you can see the, the trajectory actually was forecast to go through a region of airspace that would form contrails. And when we analyze this, uh, we found out that the climate impact from those contrails would be equivalent to emitting 64 tons of carbon dioxide. So we worked closely then with the flight planning team to um, adjust that flight plan. So flying higher and over the top of this region um, would then enable us to completely eliminate the contrail formation. And we were able to do that with only 100 kilo um, fuel penalty. And so that's 100 kilos out of 34 thousand kilos of fuel that they burnt on this flight. It's about 0.3% penalty, but we were able to, in this flight plan, prevent um, over 64 tons of climate forcing. You'll see there's actually a negative forcing. In this case, the cloud produced would actually reflect some sunlight. So a little bit like geoengineering in effect, but well, not geoengineering, um, but it had a cooling uh, effect. But the reality on the day was uh, slightly different. So the flight was a bit late departing, then there was a bit of congestion over the, the Baltic region, which meant the climb that we had planned was actually uh, taking place a little bit later, but we still managed to avoid flying through the core of that contrail forming region. We did get some small contrails forming, um, but overall we were able to save relative to that initial flight plan uh, around 64 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent forcing. So um, this was a great success. It's the first time that contrail avoidance has been done for a commercial flight. Um, here you can see a map view of our forecast. Again, if you look at that region over the Black Sea, we'll look at a satellite image now, which shows um, contrails. You can see the streaks actually did form exactly 
where we were predicting. So this is the kind of post-flight validation that we do. And then finally, just to put it into context, we analysed all of Etihad's flights in this region on that day. So there were 130 flights, 28 of those created contrails, so over 100 did not create any contrails. And it turns out that the top 10 flights on this day, so one example is EY101 going to New York, um, they collectively produced over 4,000 tonnes of CO2 equivalent forcing. Um, so this is huge. So actually what this tells us is we don't need to modify every single flight to take out the majority of the contrail forcing. If we did 5% of all of those flights, we'd solve 90% of the problem. So that's really the strategy we're taking forward. Uh, final sort of point about hydrogen, how does this fit into hydrogen? Well, there's several concept aircraft out there, some are even flying today. Um, that are going to be powered by hydrogen. So this is a very positive step forward in that we're decarbonizing um, the fuel that's used to power aircraft, but there's a couple of things that we should consider and, and that require further research. First, um, hydrogen propulsion will emit more water relative to kerosene. So that means we're more likely to get contrails forming. That could create a bigger problem potentially than we have today with kerosene. So more research is needed to understand how uh, big this issue could be. And also hydrogen leakage from infrastructure and storage and production facilities. Hydrogen being a very uh, light gas goes straight up to the stratosphere where it makes water vapor. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas. Um, and it can also uh, influence polar stratospheric cloud formation, which causes ozone destruction. So contrail management is going to become an essential part of hydrogen powered aircraft of the future and we should also understand some of the unintended consequences of of using it as as a dominant fuel for aviation in the future um, so thanks very much um thanks ever so much i don't know if you can hear me but it, uh, it was a very exciting presentation. So we have hydrogen for domestic heat, hydrogen for production, and we have also heard about uh, uh, aviation from, from, from Adam. And now, without delaying, uh, I would like to uh, introduce the um, uh, next round table, which is hydrogen for work. Um, so Chris, if you can come forward with your uh, panels. I think we, we'll start with uh, some uh, keynote speeches, but I leave it to Chris to introduce them. Um, please come forward, thank you.